Good afternoon. I am Maria Marable Bunch. I am the Associate Director for Museum Learning and Programs here at the National Museum of the American Indian. Welcome to the museum's Living Earth Festival and to this afternoon's conversation with the chefs. Mitsutam Cafe chef Freddie Basui Dene and founder and CEO of the sous chef um, of the sous chef Sean Sherman Lakota will discuss the importance of bringing indigenous foods and ingredients back to the dinner table. Greetings to those in the auditorium and to those joining us via the webcast for this engaging program, and we are happy to have you with us. Following the program, a book signing of Sean Sherman's 2018 James Beard award-winning book, The Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen, will follow directly after the program in the Rasmussen Theater Lobby. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Ben Jacobs, Os Osage, who will moderate today's conversation. Ben is co-owner and executive chef of Takeba, an American Indian eatery in Denver, Colorado. Jacobs is creating a new path for indigenous foods and dishes to be experienced. In 2012, Jacobs and his business partner and co-owner, uh, Matt Chandra, was named Entrepreneurs of the Year by the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. Dakabe continues to be on the cutting edge of a growing focus and interest in Native American cuisine. So let's welcome our speakers for this afternoon. Good afternoon, is this on? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that's always so weird, hearing about yourself. Um, and I'm glad I didn't have to do it. So I think to start, you guys should tell us about yourselves. Uh, give it a little rundown, just background of how you got here and then um, we have a lot of things, like, I'm sure we could talk for hours, but we'll try and break it down to 58 minutes. So go ahead, Freddy. All right, uh, hello everyone. I would like to say it's really great to be here, but I work here, so. <laughs> but uh, everyone from the museum knows that joke already, so. Um, well, my name is Freddy uh, Bitsui. I am Navajo, I'm from New Mexico. I was born in Utah, in this music place. Um, but uh, I entered uh, the food world unexpectedly because I originally uh, majored in anthropology. <clears throat> and so when I got to um, school, I pretty much was a you know, clean slate. I had no clue about anything except how to build a house. Um, so when I got into anthropology, I mastered the idea of being objective. You know, I, I, one instructor told me, said, you have to try to be as, as objective as possible. So I took that along with me, and when I turned out um, to be a senior, I uh, decided to uh, go to culinary school. And the whole fa uh, matter of fact was that was I was writing papers about ancient Puebla and society in New Mexico. And my instructor said, you know, every paper that you're doing has to deal with food or some type of food waste, so why don't you explore this a little bit more? So I did, and I went to culinary school. And I stayed in the kitchen. You know, I just kind of uh, started at a big hotel in Phoenix. And I still didn't know what I wanted to do until I came across a uh, lecture at Heard Museum about Native American cuisine. And that was the first time I ever heard that term. And I thought it was quite um, interesting, intriguing, because it, it, it got me as well. I was thinking, what, what, what does this mean? So I went to the lecture, and the uh, person lecturing was um, talking about salmon with the prickly pear sauce and wild rice. And I did say, you know, these are all native foods, but how does my family relate to this particular dish? And that's the question I asked the presenter. I said, how, if this is Native American, how do I relate to this? Because my tribe doesn't eat any of these foods. And it was kind of like a, a show-stopping question to everyone, because it kind of made the discussion a lot more um, in depth. So that's when I kind of started to talk about, or I did my own research about it, and um, I did another, I did a lecture to Herd, and it kind of snowballed from there, and I ended up here. So um, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Did your professor panic when you asked that question? 
Like, uh, yeah. yeah, you got the yeah, yeah. <laughs> to me, yeah. yeah. You just kind of, I just kind of saw that. Oh, great! You know, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Get that kid out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Sean, tell us about yourself. All right. Uh, my name is Sean Sherman. Um, I am from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. So I'm enrolled with the Ogallala Lakota Sioux Tribe, and I started cooking at a pretty young age, um, mostly out of necessity, just because. My mom moved my sister and I off the reservation um, right before I started high school. And like a lot of families coming off of Pine Ridge, we, money, money was something we never had around us. So I took a job right away and started working restaurants. So I got a j restaurant job when I was 13 um, and in Spearfish, South Dakota. And I was at a steakhouse called The Sluice. It was a mining-themed uh, steakhouse. <laughs> they had a, like a mining cart salad bar, I remember. Um, and, you know, so I worked restaurants all through high school and college, and after college, I moved to Minneapolis, and originally I moved to Minneapolis, I thought I was going to be an artist, because that was way cooler um, at the time, in my mind, and I didn't realize uh, when um, I was, when I got to Minneapolis and I went to the art school, um, and they're like, yeah, that sounds great, um, here's the tuition stuff, and I was like, whoa, 60 grand a year, you know, like, art's a hobby from here on out, you know, <laughs> so I kept working in restaurants, and because I'd already had quite a bit of years of experience, I moved my way up pretty quickly in the restaurant world there, so within four years of Minneapolis, I got my first executive chef job, and I was pretty young, <clears throat> um, at the time, I was still in my mid-late 20s, I suppose, and I just started a cool chef career, and I started working like farm-to-table foods um, when it was still kind of up and coming. Um, back then, there was just like a few other restaurants, like five other chefs in the whole city that were trying to figure out how to get like cool produce from the farmers and growers around us into the city, and how to like skip the big box trucks and stuff like that. Um, and it was really fun to be a part of that scene to like be a lot more kind of uh, grassroots and trying to just figure it out and working directly with real people and seeing real food a lot. Um, but then a few years into my chef career, I kind of had my epiphany on native foods too because I, you know, I realized like Minneapolis was a cool food city and you could walk all. Uh, you could walk around the city and within a few blocks you can find food from all over the world. We had Russian restaurants and um, Polish restaurants and French, Italian, like you name it. Like there was food from everywhere. But there was nothing that was representative of where I was standing. Um, and it was just kind of eye-opening to me as a chef because I had spent so much time learning food from so many other cultures. And I knew hundreds of European recipes off the top of my head and knew them really well. And I could think of, I was trying to think of like how many Lakota recipes do I really know that you know didn't contain um, Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, right? So um, it took me a long time to try to figure out like what is Native American food? You know, what are indigenous foods? And like, uh, why don't I know much about it? So for me, it was kind of a path of trying to figure that out, understanding the history of why so much knowledge was lost and why there are no native restaurants because we have cities like DC, New York City, Chicago, LA, zero Native American restaurants, you know? Ben's got them beat like 2,000 fold, you know? <laughs> With two, <laughs> exactly. Congratulations on that. <laughs> um, so uh, it's just a big, it was a big eye opener, like I said, and you know, it's, it shot me on a path to understand what my Lakota ancestors were eating um, how are people storing foods? Um, what kind of foods were they trading with other tribes? And, you know, to where we are today, where we focus on very regional indigenous foods, um, and we look at um, many different parts of understanding that, of what is an indigenous food system, and, you know, an understanding of native agriculture, and seed saving, and soil management, and farming technique, and um, cooking styles, and um, culinary preservation, and where people got salts, and fats, and sugars, and migration stories, and all sorts of stuff there's a huge long list of trying to understand an indigenous food system and we try to apply that to the foods that we do and we really focus on the health aspect of the foods and the cultural relevance um, but not trying to do a timepiece and pretend like it was 1491 but just try to take as much of the knowledge from our ancestors and knowledge that we all should have grown up knowing as indigenous peoples um, had our histories not been you know different with uh, the erasure and assimilation efforts um, and we, you know, so we're just trying to apply that to today and try to make this food an evolution. You know, we're trying to evolve it um, into something brand new by understanding those principles of the past. Right. And 
You know, it's so interesting to me because, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and we're all currently working in different regions. And we're really working in, you know, other than through our travels in, you know, very rapidly growing culinary cities like Minneapolis has award-winning chefs, DC, Denver. It's really interesting and I, 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 I like to hear that because that's what I felt too and that's what we saw in Denver when we opened was, and I grew up in Denver, um, you know, growing up in the community there and, you know, powwowing all the time and going to community gatherings and organizations and family functions, you know, there was a place to get our food, but it wasn't, readily, you know, it wasn't available all the time and that was something where I could go to an Ethiopian restaurant which is incredible food. And there's a thriving Ethiopian community there that's able to share their experiences together. I was like, well, why don't we have that? And I've been here my whole life. So that's kind of how we started as well, was like trying to create a space um, and focus on food, but also really focus on community, people, identity, sourcing, um, supporting each other. Um, so I'm really excited about the conversation because I think we can talk about a thousand things and that we all come from different areas and we're all kind of working slightly different professionally, um, which, it's fun for me. So a lot of these questions that I wrote down are like, to be selfish, were kind of for me. <laughs> it was like, I really want to know what you guys have to say about this. But I think the simplest thing to start with um, is, it may, you both kind of touched on it, but why cook? You know, it's connected to us, but why cook? And what's the most important part of the cooking? Because I get asked that often. It's like, well, why, you know, restaurants, they're really hard. Why do, you, why do you guys do that? Why cook? But I think even taking it out of the professional, you know, why, why should people cook at home? How, how do we educate those within our communities and just those of our neighbors to actually think about food and really feel purpose behind cooking again? So just I want to know what your thoughts on, like, why do we cook and what's the important part of cooking to you? Those are always the hardest questions, actually. Boom! <laughs> yeah, yeah, super hard. <laughs> no, seriously. <clears throat> uh, well, the way that I started cooking was by, um, I was forced. Um, I had the older brother when, we were, when I was young. And he was the prize runner in Arizona. He was one of the fastest runners in the state. And of course, when your parents have that kid, it's like, let's get him into college, right? So they would leave me home alone when I was in sixth grade, and my mom would just buy sandwich stuff and chips, and you know, I'd, I'd stay home by myself. And then I got bored. So I started um, playing around with the food in the refrigerator. And we lived about 50 miles outside of the Flagstaff, so we had to like, buy a lot of grocery taken home. And so one day I tried to cook a chicken and it was still frozen and I ruined it so I threw it away. And I remember this vividly because my mom kept saying, I had a chicken, where did it go? <laughs> and my father kept teasing her saying, you know, it probably ran away or, you know, just all, all, it was the funniest thing, but it's one of the vivid memories in my head. Uh, but eventually I did learn how to cook. You know, I taught myself how to cook and watching television shows and things. But my family was really not a big food family. We didn't... Um, have big Sunday parties and things like, like that. Um, we were always moving around. Um, so I always naturally cooked. And, but what I, one thing that I noticed that I would like to do, and I do it without knowing, is telling stories. Like when people, like even here, I stand and talk to someone, and we're just ending up telling all these different stories. And I learned that when I cook, I may really tell a lot of my stories while I cook. It's a, it's a great conduit to sit down and share knowledge and share ideas and you know, grow. I think it's a, I think it's a great way to build one's uh, perception about the world, you know, through cooking and, and, and sharing that experience. So fundamentally, I think why cook is, it's a great way to communicate, and I think it's the best way to communicate with one another. I, 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 Good I, answer. <laughs> it took me a, took a, yeah. thanks, for, thank, th thanks for the question in advance. It started with the easy one, I think. <laughs> Uh, I would like the questions in advance next time. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> um, you know, I feel, you know, cooking is such an important part, and we really look at the, nece I look at the necessity of cooking on a community scale. It's really important to have that, that part, because for indigenous peoples, cooking is, re food is really the center of everything, you know, and I realized it really early on in my work, because I remember, uh, 
you know, reaching out to the History Center in St. Paul when I first started to utilize them for some of the research that I was doing and, you know, inquire if it'd be possible to, you know, see what they had in their collections and, you know, just kind of seeing what kind of relationship I could create. And they were very open and welcome and they were able to, you know, take me down into their archives and pull out all these drawers of all this wonderful stuff, you know, so many cool things. And it really helped me um, seeing these pieces from the past there in front of me uh, to think about it. So we did an event early on when I first started the sous chef a few years back and um, we wanted to pull out uh, anything that had to do with food. We were like, let's just look through the list and let's try to find stuff that has this food related and let's pull that stuff out and we'll make a cool exhibit. And very quickly as we started looking through this list and looking at pieces, we realized like everything was touching food somehow. You know, because there was pottery to hold food in, there was weaving and basketry um, to hold food in, there was uh, farming utensils and cooking utensils, wild ricing utensils and maple sugaring utensils, every single artifact in there, even all the artwork, you know, look at all this beautiful floral work and all these things and everything is also very food related. So realizing that food was really kind of the center of it. And I was as you know, in the beginning when I was kind of designing you know, um, our vision of what an indigenous food system looks like, you know, keeping food at the center was really the important part. And for indigenous communities, like having food um, was something that they had to work really hard for, but it was something the entire community worked together on. Because um, people, again, you're farming, you're fishing, you're um, foraging, you're growing things, you're um, teaching kids how to do this stuff, you're passing down that knowledge. Um, and there's a lot of tradition involved in all these pieces. There's a lot of uh, ceremony involved. There's a lot of spirituality tied into it, you know. But food was, so everybody was doing something for the food system. Everybody was chipping into the foods and giving back to the entire community. And I really liked that because nobody was paying for food. Like the concept of paying for food did not exist not that long ago for indigenous peoples um, in many parts of the world. And, you know, it was just that they had to work hard and they understood the seasons, they understood the moons, they understood everything of how to live sustainably. So indigenous peoples have the blueprint of how to live sustainably utilizing just your environment using only plants and animals of your region for everything, right? So it's a really beautiful um, vision to see like how much valuable knowledge on a worldwide scale there is from indigenous peoples everywhere, keeping food at the center of it, you know, and part of um, identifying also um, the term indigenous education is really important, too, because Again, um, because of assimilation efforts, um, we lost um, a couple of generations that should have been no uh, learning about their ancestors' knowledge that had been passed down for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, you know, tens of thousands of years of generational knowledge being handed down. That was, gen that was indigenous education, and that's what was important, because that was how to survive utilizing our, our, our region, our ecosystem around us, and being a part of it, not being above it, but actually being a part of it all. And making sure that there was food for everybody, and it's a commonality that you're going to find in all indigenous communities where food is really, really important, and it's an identifier for people, you know? So we really believe um, for indigenous peoples to have, especially in the U.S. and Canada, to have been forcibly removed from not only their education and their knowledges, but also their foods have been extremely damaging. But our generations are at this point where we can start to return that. And we're you know, taking steps towards a more healthy and holistic approach to it, where it's not about us as an, as an ego trip, and it's not about what we're doing, but we're looking at the bigger picture of it all. And it's kind of showing how an entire community can rebuild that. Um, and it's going to be empowering for a lot of indigenous communities, but they need a kitchen at the center. They need some place where they can cook. They need some place where they can um, share um, their experiences, their creativity, their passion, their energy, their traditions through the food to their loved ones around them and to people coming into their community to welcome them. But it's ne it's a necessity, you know, like we need that because we've been so far removed from our food systems for so long. A lot of kids don't know where foods come from. A lot of kids don't even see fresh foods, especially on reservations because they don't, it's just not around them. You know, some reservations are better off than some, you know, there's different scales of things of where things are at. But overall, we lost a lot of tradition and knowledge and health. So it's really important. And, and then that's the reason why we cook, you know, as uh, with uh, the group that we have in Minneapolis and the people that we meet, we just try to pour our passion and try to open it up so hopefully the um, people coming in will find a passion somewhere in there too. And we feel like food is such a beautiful center to start with. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's I always love how things are so interconnected and how we, 
even though we have different approaches and we, you know, we come from different areas that we have very much the same feelings. And that's like, to me, cooking is community. And that's exactly what I get. Like, to me, that's truly what the harvest is. And that's why you cook, even from the point of, so like in some of our travels and you work and can you, you know, being asked, can you teach recipes? It's like, sure, we can teach recipes, but we can, what we can really teach is time. Like we can teach being together and working together. So like even in a traditional, like someone lighting the fire, keeping the fire, people bringing the food out, whoever's over the fire, stirring, mixing, watching, working together. Cooking is community. Uh, it's teaching, it's learning, it's educating one another, and then being a part of each other's lives. Um, and that's what's also fun when we can come together and cook together too, is because you can bring your experiences from your life and from your community and share that and see how much we overlap and see how much we can teach each other, but how similar we are. Um, which kind of brings me to like, my question is, you know, we have a lot of complexities, I think, with being so culturally driven and so um, trying to hold on to the meaning in the respect of the communities we come from, the people that we come from. But at the same time, as you said, you know, we, we have this professional approach as well. So, you know, what I'm interested in is how do you take these traditional ideas, these traditional methods, these traditional ingredients and incorporate that into the process? Like what is your process for development and bringing it into you know, what they call a modern palate or modern taste buds? Um, and how, kind of what's your process for developing recipes, even though I'm saying recipes can be anything? You know? Well, th that's probably one of my favorite questions. Um, be <laughs> because- Do you write these? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is your notebook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because uh, when I got here to the this... The next um, one says, Freddy's the man. <laughs> it probably does. <laughs> uh, um, when I got here, uh, my cooks were very fam more familiar with um, French technique. And um, to, the, to the cook world, a technique is something as simple as cooking with oil or without oil. And... In, in the you know in the non-professional cooking world, these things don't matter. It's just kind of like, well, you know, you're using the oil or you're not. But these particular techniques that um, the French use are pretty much you know universal throughout the Western world. So when I got here and I started changing the menu, um, there was a lot of people were just kind of like afraid to to cook the way that I instructed them, and we had a lot of disputes. My sous chefs would say, you know, this is not, this is not the right way to do it. Um, my chef supervisor would say this is not done right. And it's kind of like this battle because um, in, in the East, the professional food, the food world, like with the chefs and all, it, it's a very um, difficult world to be in. And because you're constantly battling with ego, you know, you, there has to be like this um, strong-minded and strong-willed individual to be there because it's, 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 it's a real mess. And so um, fighting with people is, is, is what I do best, I think. Uh, <laughs> because I did, a, I, did a, I did a dinner at the Met Museum, and that was probably one of the biggest you know, um, honors I've, I, I, I did. And when I explained to the cooks there on, on how to um, do the dishes, they were, they were very welcoming. And that's when I kind of thought, this is really nice, because this is the first time I've been into a, a, a kitchen in New York where not one cook said, this is wrong, or this is, you know, this doesn't make any sense. But um, when I look at the old recipes at this cafe, the entire ingredient list can, it went up to 20 ingredients. But with, um, with, nav uh, with native recipes, um, they're very simple, and there's nothing in there. Uh, I put Navajo lamb soup on the menu, and it's equal parts lamb, um, potatoes, celery, and carrots, and water. But it's the technique of you know extracting so much flavor out of that that every that's one of my highly most complimented soups that that I have on the line. So coming from the professional world and integrating these native foods into my kitchen um, is mainly dealing with reteaching my cooks how to prepare food, and I'm constantly you know throwing things out because they're cooking it wrong. I hope my boss didn't hear that. Um, but um, like with the pasole, for example. Um, before they used to thicken it with either a roux, cornstarch, or something, and I said, no, no, you don't do this, because um, chilies have a, the seeds in them have lecithin, which is a natural thickener. And, uh, and when you make tomato sauce, the t seeds in tomato have that natural th um, thickening aspect. So with native cooking, it's really 
to, to t uh, mastering what these ingredients can do for the dish and for yourself. You know, that's really fundamentally what I'm trying to teach uh, my cooks and the people, you know, the other people that come around that I um, talk, when I talk about native foods or lecture about native foods, because it is uh, making someone relearn how to cook. It's kind of like um, moving to a different country and trying to be a part of the culture. You know, I've never moved to a different country, but um, it, it's, that, it's that foreign to, to many cooks and it's scary at times. But um, as long as someone's there to you know guide people through that journey of you know trying to learn how to make native food, it, it's quite fun. And there's a lot of um, discussion about it, especially when it gets up on the, on the line as well. Um, and, and it's really appreciated. And I know that there's a big difference um, with the food on the line than when, you know like three years ago before I got here. So that's pretty much. I think it's all about technique. Can you repeat the question? Uh, it's hard reading Freddie's writing here. Um, I was just saying, uh, I'm interested in uh, just incorporating technique and tradition into your process so you mm -hmm. can still keep it true to what and where it comes from, but also to, to update. And that's one thing, you know, that, that I think is hard sometimes when people come in, they want it to be, you know, all other cuisines um, are constantly growing. You hear that. You see it on TV. We're like, oh, that was so 1992 or whatever. And I don't even know what was going on in 92. But <laughs> but that's the thing is sometimes when people want native cuisine, they want 200 years ago, 300 years ago. It doesn't mean you can't use those ingredients from then and then make it something that is just as much now and progressive and continuing and being creative. So that's why I want to know. is like, mm -hmm. what's your process taking such traditional ingredients and ideas and concepts and then creating your own process, but keeping it true to you know the heart of what it is. Yeah. So our approach was to really look at regional indigenous foods. You know, so we looked at the land that we were currently standing on and thought about the history there because it doesn't matter where you are in North America, you're standing on indigenous land, and there's indigenous history and flavor all around you. So we were creating dishes like when we uh, first opened up the sous chef as a catering company and uh, developed our food truck to Tonka truck. Um, and we were going to serve only foods of the Dakota and Ojibwe people of that region, you know, and we were using things that were very particular to right where we were in the history of it. So we look at, you know, was there agriculture? And if so, what kind of seeds are still available that are particular to even right where we're standing? So we were able to find some like Dakota blue corns and we were able to find a bunch of uh, produce, uh, agricultural pieces from N North Dakota next door to us, you know, from the farming tribes there with the Hadatsa and the Arikara and the Mandan. So utilizing like Hadatsa shield beans and Arikara yellow beans and uh, Arikara sunflowers and all these pieces, right? So that was one piece of it, was looking for any of those kinds of foods out there. But the problem with that was there was not a lot of that in production out there. So that was a part of it. But we're also looking at, you know, the wild foods, too, because we knew that indigenous peoples, because of that knowledge of being able to survive with plants and things around them, knew that every single plant out there had a purpose, you know. So understanding that everything has a purpose um, and taking the time to learn it. So not, you know, stop using the term weed, but actually taking the time to learn all the plants in your region. And we're in this era today where a lot of the plants around us are what you would call invasive species because they've come from somewhere else and they're taking over areas. So we see, of course, lots of dandelion and purslane and plantain and things like this. That's kind of all over the landscape today. And a lot of these people that uh, plants that people battle in their gardens constantly are not indigenous plants from the region. But instead of like, you know, we look at it with those plants with an indigenous perspective also. So like, what is the purpose of this plant? You know, because it could be food, it could be medicine, you could probably craft something with it, it can make mats or dyes or clothing or who knows what, right? And just trying to take the time to find out what the purpose, so, you know, because a native person isn't going to be like, oh, I wish I had a $50 chemical to spray on that patch of dandelion that just popped up over there. You know, we're taking the time to learn what it's good for, you know, and you see so much food around you when you're using that perspective. So we were just looking what's available to us f physically standing where we were and just looking around, you know. So we were using things like um, 
walleye, of course, and wild rice and rose hips and cedar and tamarack and sunchokes. And we could literally like stand on one spot in Minnesota and just glance around and see all those ingredients right around us and making foods with those very small flavors, like taking, putting our, putting ourselves into a box to challenge ourselves to how many cool recipes can we come up with the ingredients that are right near us? Because knowing that people have lived here for tens of thousands of years, you know, so obviously they ate food and they ate well because all humans love food and we wanted to like try to figure that out so we did our best to research a lot of traditional recipes as much as we could of course and find out how people were doing traditional pieces because we were able to learn a lot about food preservation techniques and some of the techniques that they were using for boiling things and processing corns and things like that that we still utilize today but for the most part we were just trying to rebuild the ancestral pantry and try to understand all the different flavors between domesticated varietals and wild varietals especially with plants like animals are the easy piece like anybody could break down an animal and you have it right um, so for us we tried to cook with just what was around us and using um, only uh, mostly a, you know, featuring indigenous foods primarily um, but we were cutting out colonial ingredients particularly dairy wheat flour cane sugar beef pork and chicken mostly just to prove the point that we still could come up with all sorts of cool recipes with just these ingredients. And then that's what helped us define how we were doing this because then we were able to travel anywhere. You can throw a dart at the map of North America and wherever it lands, you can do the same work anywhere, you know? So it doesn't matter if we are up in the Pacific Northwest or if we're in the Southwest or deep in Mexico or way up in Alaska, you know, we're able to come in have the research research ability and the resources to uh, re, uh, just just find that resources around us. So like, you know, we were able to go and do the James Beard House dinner in Manhattan featuring just the foods and flavors of just Manhattan of what would have been there if it wasn't just a cityscape today, right? Asphalt, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you cook building? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gravel so, taste amazing. It's like, you know, what is yeah. the indigenous food? Some people would say it's like pizza from the village or, you know, you know yeah. some hot dogs yeah, down. Pizza, yeah. Or, yeah, but, <laughs> but, you know, but but we could find, you know, indigenous uh, agricultural pieces. We were able to find fishermen who are still using some of the cool varieties that aren't widely used, uh, but the native peoples are still using them. Uh, knew what kind of animals would typically grow. Up. So you could do it anywhere. And we should have native restaurants all across the country. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason to not see Native American restaurants in every single city that you go to. And they should be regional to really focus on the tribe and the history of where we're standing right there, particularly. There's so much diversity out there. So instead of trying to like either lump some all Native Americans into one group um, and try to just like make it really generalized but more so just celebrate that diversity you know we should be you know we should be able to see like as indigenous peoples we know whose land that we're coming into and it's not like we know who owns the land we know who the land really is a part of you know right. so we know if we're in Diné territory if we're in Lakota territory or forever right we know we have a, a sense of the history of the land and then food can help people do that so the rest native restaurants would help really um, people really identify what are true North American flavors, you know, because right. I'm in Minnesota and people say, what are Minnesota foods? People will think like Nordic and Finnish. And it's not. That's just because they moved here 100 years ago. It doesn't mean <laughs> that that's right. the flavor of Minnesota. You know, it's really like the true source source. That's like the, the, the foods and the flavors of the earth around you. Right. And that's how we try to look at the foods, you know, and that's fun and challenging for us, you know. Yeah. And that's that's really the fun part about food. And what I like what you said is, uh, you know, we work with a, a local organization in Denver called Four Winds American Indian Council where we take all of our food scraps from the kitchen, we give it to them, they make compost, and then they have their own garden. The food directly out of that goes straight to community members, elders, uh, people in the community. We always joke when we go over there, she says, Shannon Francis is her name, who does all the growing. You know, she's like, people walk by this every day, and there's so much food right here, and they never steal it. It's because they don't, you know, and she's like, open, to, yeah, take it. If, if people are going to take it, but that's the point is people don't know what it is. People don't realize that there's all these things there that are food. Um, and I just think that's so neat in being able, and, you know, Sean and I talked about this earlier is, early is, you know, I'm, I'm really even learning that because I don't have those techniques um, of being able to identify 
um, you know, wild foods and things like that, but trying to incorporate those and learn from others and take that. And one thing, you know, talking and about. One, I mean, interrupt, but like no, when okay. I came on, like I had limited, um, yeah, I started teaching myself, but I just hired an ethnobotanist to be on my culinary yeah. team because it was way easier to teach an ethnobotanist how to cook than, you know, yeah. teach myself <laughs> yeah, ethnobotany. Exactly. So Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Genius. Yeah, genius. You know, I, I invited um, Sean to California. I, I do this event every year in California in, in, in a town called Idlewild. And when I had a, like a little dinner for, for everyone that was there. And he shows up and he gets out of the car and he just goes straight to the plants. And I thought, this guy's good. Now I just found out he hired an ethnobotanist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Hired a landscaper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, so with that, I... Um, you know, I've, I've struggled with a, sometimes with the tag of, you know, being a chef and things like that. And it's very uncomfortable because I wasn't trained. I feel like it was very something that was earned um, from people that went through. But speaking about, you know, over the years and talking to people, it's almost like it's better, f you know, it's good because you don't have necessarily those bad, not bad habits, but different habits. Um, like you're talking about having to kind of teach someone a new way, not a French technique, but you know, you can take the techniques you knew growing up and then you can learn from other people in these techniques. So I started to become more comfortable because I think that it is okay to have native chefs because it's just a different approach. It's a different technique and it's our technique. Mm -hmm. we sh it's totally rightful for us to be chefs as well. But I got, I was worried about the title of being, you know, it's earned, but we, we are earning it. You know, we're earning it together and learning and being inspired by each other. And, you know, one thing that I want to know from you, just because we all have to go through it, you know, from a professional standpoint, is, you know, when you put your heart and soul into something and something that you believe in and people that you believe in, that's what it comes down when you believe in people and you believe in your community and what you and what everyone else represents, you put something out on a plate, especially in this day and age when, you know, foodies are everywhere, and we're in these culinary cities. Like, what's your response when people just totally rip apart or criticize? You know, how do you take that and then do you use that as an education standpoint? Do you use, well, it's opening up your taste buds to something different? I mean, how do we do as something that you put your heart and soul into as just cooks in general, but also something that's so culturally connected to us? What's your approach when people kind of, uh, you know, I hate to say bash, but, you know, criticize those types of things because it can be it can be tough um well i used to um travel a lot and i had a youtube channel and i made a mistake by reading the comments and uh it was just you know just mean 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 and so i stopped reading them but um i've learned to take criticism at any level i think it's um well number one i'm 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 the cook here at the museum, and I get many, many guests every single day who tell me, oh, the soup is wrong, my grandmother didn't make it, the fried bread's wrong, you know, my, the soup's wrong, this is not what we ate, the soup's wrong, the fried bread's wrong, every single day. And That's why I always say if we're in second place, then that's fine, because I'm not going to beat your grandma, and you're not going to be mine. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, you know, it's to the point where I don't really respond emotionally. It, it's very... Um, um, you know, it, it's 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 it'll just be a generalized term, but nothing I think anybody can say really tugs at my emotions um, because I think it's it's a learning experience because there are things that I do try and it, it might not come out right. You know, just just because I have an ex experience cooking doesn't necessarily mean I balance those flavors correctly. So when c criticism comes, it usually is for me in the form of teaching something that I didn't know. So um, I've, I've learned just to try, and if they don't like it, you know, I'll, I deal with it, you know. So that's pretty much how it you is. You don't go full Gordon Ramsay and like... No. <laughs> that's to my cooks. <laughs> uh, and I just put marijuana in all my food, yeah. so everybody's really happy just after that. they laughing the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel it's safer. <laughs> You're like, sorry, we don't order, uh, we don't serve ice cream at the end. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> Could really go for ice cream. No, I just think that's important because it's hard, and it happens to cooks. You know, it happens when you do these things, and it's it can be tough. And, and for young, especially young native chefs, you know, you don't want it to turn anyone away from it. You know, and I remember when I was, you know, I was super, when we started the restaurant, I was young. I was 25, and we had just opened, and I had this... I wanted to make something for the community. I wanted to work with food and all these different things. And, 
you know, beyond just the criticism of food, it was like something about people that was hard. Um, and I had someone tell me that um, it was okay. And I was like, all right, that's fine. Like, same thing, learning. What, what could we do better? And it was the, uh, you know, I think you should figure out who you are and do that. And we already have a complex enough identity that we have to share to people. You know, you almost have to battle for that sometimes too. So that can be very hard. You know, luckily it can build thick skin and keep people going. But that's why I always ask is because I like to tell young people is like, you will get criticism sometimes, especially cooking professionally. But to keep going, to learn and realize that your belief that you have behind that is the true motivator. And just because, you know, what I've come to the point is to each his own. If you don't like the food, so be it. It's okay. You know, you may not like it. There's some things I don't like, but um, to use it as a motivating factor. So I just like to hear what other people um, approaches. But, you know, beyond that, you know, I think that, you know, we're all fortunate to be in the positions we are, you know, and not to say that it's not due to hard work and things like that. But, you know, something that I wanted to know is, you know, we all work with our communities. We work closely with people. But being in a fortunate position, how, you know, do you have a feeling that you, you, like, how do you give back? Like, what do you owe to our community? Do you feel like you owe anything, um, you know, with this position that we've been able to be in and the three of us sit here today? Um, that's just something, because I, I think about it a lot. Like, what, what, what do I owe to people um, for being where I am today? I did everything on my own. <laughs> it also says that here. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a really I... motivating <laughs> notebook you have. Um, no, I, uh, I started out, um, like you said, um, I, I worked for a French chef. This is a famous story. You probably might have heard it before, but I worked for a French chef, and he was tremendously um, knowledgeable about food. He taught me how to be a, a, a good cook, but he had um, views about native foods, and he was trying to do a native school. And um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't understand why native foods are so expensive. And his one term to me was, why is your food so expensive if all of you are so poor? You know? And uh, I quit a week later. So I said, I'm going to start my own little company and, you know, I'm going to do this. And coming from, you know, from just nothing and, you know, working, learning, making mistakes, um, you know, just actually kind of focusing on wanting to be a cook that explained to people what native food is, you know, what it could be, um, was probably my, my, my driving force. It just kind of, I never went off gear with that. And, you know, so it is, I'm very fortunate to be here, especially, um, um, you know, with the amount of work that I've done to the cafe. Um, going on your point about, um, being more, instead of just regionalizing tribes, like, oh, the Apaches, the Navajos live in the Southwest, and, you know, these people live here. Um, you know, we're more global than, than that. So I got rid of the regions of the stations, and we, we're using product, and we're using different themes. So all menus in the cafe are regionalized. And I think it explains and tells the story a lot better. So, you know, just, just to go off of that, it, it's, it's, it's really the mistakes I've made and everything that, you know, it really did pay off, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And um, it, it was def definitely really hard. And I know, it made me who I am too. I can, I can stand up to New York chefs and it's pretty cool, you know. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel really lucky to have found the path that I'm on and to really find something that um, people are giving, I'm doing something where I can really give something back. You know, and that's really important, you know, because I never wanted to be I never wanted to be a chef. Number one, that just kind of happened by accident, you know, because I was just in the restaurant business for so long. I got the opportunity and I just went for it. Um, but, you know, again, I thought I was going to be an artist. So, <laughs> But, you know, I found art through food, which is a whole different way of doing it, you know. But, um, you know, and, you know, and when I was growing up, you know, my dad, um, he had a rough beginning because he was Vietnam vet, and then right after Vietnam, he gets back to uh, um, he gets back to Pine Ridge, right in the middle of the American Indian Movement standoff in uh, Pine Ridge on Wounded Knee, and that was just a messy era, you know. And I was born into that era, um, and you know, and he had a he struggled a little bit with depression um, and substance abuse when he was younger, like that, but. He was able to turn his life around, and he started a nonprofit um, called Lakota Fund, 
which um, basically they started on Pine Ridge as a um, community development initiative, you know, and back then there were, I, I want to say there was barely any um, uh, businesses on Pine Ridge at all, um, and none of them were native owned uh, that were there. And after starting this microloan program where they actually learned uh, from people in banking systems in Bangladesh of how they were able to take a really poor area and develop businesses there from entrepreneurs who had very little experience but maybe they have an idea and give them a little bit of seed money to kind of start on their own. Um, so they started that on Pine Ridge and when the first year uh, of their existence they were able to uh, there was 35 Lakota owned businesses on Pine Ridge the very first year. And that model was in the early 80s and it took off like wildfire. So it's pretty typical to see these microloan programs all over the country today, you know. And, you know, I thought when I was young and um, not really understanding some of that until I was a little bit older, but seeing the, the value of doing something that really gives back was something that I really admired growing up and it's something that I strive to do um, and try to find it because. I didn't, again, like usually in restaurants, um, they can be so ego driven, you know, it's about the chef and their creativity because they're the artiste, you know, and I wanted to get past that ego and do something different. Like, you know, I can make food look pretty and that's an expression of myself and that's a form of art and I enjoy that part, but it's different when, with, especially with what we're all doing um, and raising awareness about indigenous foods and indigenous culture at the same time. Um, and giving the chance to, to push back on something, you know. So, you know, I developed my entire nonprofit around indigenous education and f um, food access to try to figure out how to give this back and do something, you know, that can make a difference that will outlast me. And we really look ahead. We look, um, we're like, I see all the work that we try to, that we're trying to accomplish before my time is over, um, is really just trying to set up the groundwork for the next generation of people to come and really doing this for them because I figured if they have the opportunity, um, the access and the confidence um, and the platform to work off of already, like things that I didn't have growing up, that they could do so much more in their lifetime than I could have ever try, you know, tried to, you know? Because they could grow up knowing exactly what their indigenous foods are, they can grow up um, uh, with the ability to create more, you know, and do something different. So I see it, it being really important to think about that following generation and that's what I really try to strive for. Like the best thing you can really do in life is to leave the next generation set up to be stronger. You know, so I see that as really important. And, you know, um, looking at what we do, like I think we have such limited time on this earth anyways, and we should be really utilizing it to help others. Um, and, you know, be feel blessed if you can, if you can find that path to do that, you know. So somebody said to me oh, when I first started the sous chef, they said um, they left with a quote saying, be the answer to your ancestors prayers. And, you know, that's the best you can strive for is to try to do something that people can be proud of, your ancestors would be proud of, and you're doing something for that future generation. So there's a lot out there. I, I forgot to mention, I, um, I, I do a lot of traveling on my own. And so, like, schools in Arizona might want a native chef to just kind of pep talk. I'll do that for free. I mean, I'll utilize my time, and, I, you know, I have to be here as much as I can. But um, whoever needs anything, I always go out there and I help them. Uh, if some organizations in Phoenix, I help out, um, and I don't, I don't charge them a thing. Yeah. So it's... Uh it's funny you said, I was, there's so many things, I like wanted to write things down because there's so many things that I could respond to and didn't want to interrupt it either of you. Uh, but it's, it's funny you say that you were, you know, you're going to be an artist and anthropologist. It's like, I actually, right out of college, I got a job here as like a, a cultural interpreter or something like that. And not knowing your path, I wasn't prepared, didn't do it, and then found myself into what is my true passion, you know, and which is food, which is cooking, which is, um, you know, community um, and kind of, you know where where I am now. Um, I lost my train of thought of what what um, we've been talking about. Oh, but um, talking about um, like the the future and the future generation. Sean and I were talking about this earlier. Is that um, we are here for a short period of time, and that we have so much that we can offer, and that the kids that are interested in foods now and cooking now are going to do far greater things than we're doing, and all we can do is you know, understand that we're, we will fade and we will go and helping to set them up. And I just want to say this because I thought it's such a beautiful statement um, that I heard Valerie Seacrest say 
who's Muckleshoot. Um, she's a she's a food sovereignty for uh, Muckleshoot tribe, and she has a little one. And when she breastfeeds, she says, "I understand that I'm feeding my grandchildren," and like that's a very beautiful approach to understanding that the work you do now is generations down the line. Um, and we we do we we owe it to work together, and we owe it to the community. And that's what I liked what you said as well. Sorry, with so many much you both said is. You know, we, we're the same way. We're, we're not executive chefs. We, we don't do that in our space. And we say we're a restaurant by community because there's voices. Um, everyone has a voice and a stance. Even if you're 17 years old or you're 45 or however old, everyone has a voice within the space to help develop. Because, again, we're developing something together and something that is for the future. And educating and learning from one another um, is really important. And, Kind of along with that, and one question that I have, you know, from that approach and also from kind of the professional approaches, you know, whether it's food sourcing or it's the people that work for you and with you, there's the job training is, you know, what do you see for us um, in our professional world is how can we be these economic drivers that can help for our future and help take care of people? Because it is keeping, you know, money within our communities getting to the economic standpoint because that's something that we have to think about of riding that balance as we've discussed, you know, between being so culturally aware and culturally sensitive and culturally educating ourselves, but also having to understand to perpetuate the philosophies and ideas that we have to stay kind of economically viable, and that can be difficult. Um, so what do you see as being, you know, kind of economic drivers that you can help um, for these eventual future generations, future leaders, future cooks and chefs that will do amazing, amazing things, even front of the house staff, all those. You know, what's your approach to really kind of helping that progress um, down the road? Well, that's also my biggest problem for, for where I work right now is sourcing. Um, I cannot source anything um, for a good amount of time. I was just talking to the people with the wild rice outside, and I said, can I get your wild rice here? Um, and they go, how much do you need? I said, I, need, I use at least 50 pounds a week. And they said, oh, that's too much. You know? And so it's, it's really difficult to, you know, so I'm, I'm always on my toes finding places to order food from, to get food from places. You know, I have to meet, you know, my corporation's rules as well. So that's probably the thing that makes me the busiest every single day is trying to find ingredients. So I think um, for the future, I think it'll be a, a good way for someone to view opening a sourcing company or anything in that level because I think that would be the most important thing to, to drive the, the native food. Um, Yeah, um, we see a lot of opportunity out there for indigenous foods because the work that we're doing is driving demand um, and we're raising awareness for the importance of indigenous foods. And, you know, um, you know, like Ben and I had talked earlier, um, we rented those little scooters, the little little kick, kick scooters. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we should have been matching. The <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ever, if the cooking thing doesn't work out, we're starting a scooter game. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, and you know, With we, two of us, you want in? Yeah. 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 <laughs> serious commitment. <laughs> um, but we were just talking about, you know, uh, how we do some of the business models and the tiers that we use, and we were, were very similar. So we try to purchase from indigenous producers first, and this is how I started with my company in Minnesota. So I was buying all my wild rice from uh, the tribes around me. So we had a lot of the true Minnesota wild rice, so not that black California patty rice that you see out there, but the, the true rice that comes out of the lakes using a lot of, um, I was buying foods directly from three native farms around me. Um, maple, there was a fishery in the Red Lake Nation up north, which is an Anishinaabe tribe in the north. And we were lucky that we had all these resources around us from indigenous peoples already. So I was pushing as much food dollars into the native producers as much as possible. But again, there's not a lot of native producers and they don't have the volume to really keep up. So I was just there to support them as much as I can. And like, I'm happy to purchase as much as I can to support you guys. And um, but we're going to keep growing. So let's all grow together. You know, it was the conversations that we've been having from the very beginning. 
And then um, supporting my local community, too, because I have a lot of beautiful friends that are not indigenous, but they're growing a, a lot of amazing stuff that fits perfectly with what we do. And we love vegetables anyway, so we just put a ton of produce on everything, you know. Um, so we support um, a lot of our uh, food dollars within our community, which is something that I've always practiced as a chef anyways. And then we'll buy from whatever sources, you know, organic or, you know, from there on. But, you know, we try to do that but we see the the need of indigenous food producers being really high and the opportunities being um, pretty amazing really because all of these groups out there could have opportunities to produce all sorts of stuff you know they could be harvesting wild foods from their regions and processing them they could be uh, making different kinds of products they could be growing all sorts of native seeds everywhere um, and there's just so much opportunity out there for them to do that and you know people like us are going to be able to continue to drive that demand to have a place for them to sell and eventually as we all grow we're going to be able to create larger and larger networks to make sure that that becomes a, a strong uh, possibility you know and there's entire you know the communities themselves should be really jumping on these opportunities and helping to organize and put the funding into it to get them off the ground because we need more and more native producers out there mm -hmm. so um, it's going to get there yeah 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 and that's that's um you know, our approach is obviously very similar with with that, and we do the native first, local second, kind of everything beyond. And you know what what I always like to say, and in, in no way trying to be, you know, big headed or arrogant. And it's not just about our restaurant, but it's about what you do. It's about what you what we do is that I my belief is that all of the work, the restaurants and things that are being developed are too important to fail. And we need to support each other. And the reason I say they're too important to fail is because of the impacts that we can have on multiple communities all over. And that's the thing that, you know, chefs always get the, man, what a beautiful plate. You made this amazing thing. But the amount of effort and the dirty hands that went into just getting something to you, and then even past that, the person that cleaned the plate, like there's so much that goes into it. To me, that I say not we're too important to fail. Tokabe is that you know, or, or you know, um, the sous chef is just too important. It's the impact that we can all create is too important to fail. And so um, I, you know, a mentor of mine, actually, you know him as well. Um, Walt Poirier always says, and what I, my cousin, yeah, I was gonna say, I, I was gonna, I thought so, but I didn't want to say it in this. Um, but yeah, he's been a mentor cousin. of mine. Came in the first day that we we opened the restaurant, you know, ten and a half years ago. And uh, Chad, and he always says, you thrive, I thrive, we thrive. So if, if you can thrive and I can thrive and we can work together, we can all thrive as one. And I think that's a beautiful expression of how we can work together. And we, we truly can create restaurants in every community because it should be there. And we should support each other. And Sean and I talked about this earlier. You know, people will say, well, what about competition? It's like, it's not competition. It's support. Um, it's getting a voice. It's helping food producers. It's helping people and communities. So I think, again, the more we can push for this, um, you know, the better. And I, I see beautiful things for the future as well. But we're running super short on time. So we have a couple minutes. And I'm, I, was, I was told I'm pretty good on the, the time. But I have two questions that I want to finish with. Lightning round. All right. Um, one, I just want to know, what is your favorite either traditional ingredient or your tradition, uh, or like uh, menu, or not menu, um, recipe that you like. Like, what is what takes you back to being little, or what is just a, something that gives you a memory? What's your favorite um, ingredient or recipe? Uh, roast chicken. It, it's only because uh, frozen roast <laughs> chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just have this memory of of um, being outside my grandmother's house. It was one of those rarities when. I was alone with my grandmother. My, my parents were somewhere in Farmington or something, but um, we had to go down. She lived on the Mesa in um, southern Utah, right, right next to Cortez, Colorado. And we drove, she packed a lunch. So I saw her take the chicken out, roll it, and then wrap it in a paper bag, and we went down to the, to the valley. And apparently we were waiting for a medicine man because back then there were no cell phones. So you had to sit outside their house for hours, and so uh, she um, opened the chicken with the with foil, and back then you had the little Morton salt things, and um, she sprinkled it on the chicken, and I just remember hearing the grains of the granules of the salt dancing off the aluminum foil, and that's the only thing that I always remember, so every time I eat chicken, I think of that. Uh, my, mine's choke cherry, 
um, cause it's just a, such an interesting smell and it always just zips me back to big family gatherings growing up. So just a huge vat of choke cherries that we all as kids would go out and harvest and, uh, you know, throw into buckets and our fingers would be dark purple and, uh, you know, just the, the smell of that cooking on the stove and we, we get to play with it quite a bit. Um, you know, nowadays, since we play with the foods all the time. And that one just always is that one of those memory things where just zips you back to being like yeah. five years old. Yeah, that's like for for me, I was a very picky eater, which is weird now that this is what I what I do. If you ask anyone of my siblings or parents, they would never have, would have thought this is what I do. But <laughs> it's uh, Osage style corn soup for me because it makes me feel, it makes me remember people that are, aren't here anymore. And it makes me feel uh, little again. So yeah, that's that's my favorite. But beyond that, I really want to know what's the guilty pleasure. <laughs> Any of Sean's weed food. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> My guilty pleasure would be gas station nachos. <laughs> <laughs> Love honest, honesty. <laughs> no, because I, I grew up in the West where you drive everywhere. So you pull over, you have to get gas. And it's that thing. It's just like a beam of lights on it. You say, I'm going to get that, you know. It's a tough question, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. That's a tough question. Keep it for hard for last. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, mine is occasionally a little bit of ice cream because that's cream. what I have with my kids. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. I mean, I don't have much of a sweet tooth. I like I like a little little bite of chocolate. Yeah. So like I have a weird thing. It's like one little bite of chocolate at the end of the night, and then I'm really happy with that, you know. Yeah. And I have uh, like uh, espresso. I have to have an espresso oh, yeah. in the morning. It's <laughs> just like one shot, and that's all I need. But it has to be good espresso. I'm such an espresso snob, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand why people would spend eight thousand dollars on an espresso machine and never learn how to make one. Right, right. <laughs> a sweet machine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, do you, do you have anything you want to finish up with? Um, anything that because we have a couple, a minute or two. Hmm. Well, I remember uh, meeting and getting to know both of you when we were really starting out, you know, we were, you had just opened Takabe, and I think we just became acquainted on Facebook, you know, and it, it's just amazing the journeys and everything that, you know, let us kind of, it's like full circle kind of thing for me, so yeah, it's really great to be here. Yeah, no, this is great. I wish we all had more time to hang out together more, because we have obviously a lot in common, and endless conversations that we could all be sharing but you know we're all friends and we're gonna keep the conversations rolling no matter what but i appreciate you guys so much for both of your hard work obviously um and you guys are great role models you know just like we're trying to build more role models in our organization you guys are doing it out there too and you know it's just it's a lot of respect to you guys so yeah. Yeah. and i just to to finish up you know want to thank the smithsonian for having us out so I think it's really important to continue having these conversations in such a large open platform um, in continuing the conversation. Thank the two of you for, you know, having a lot of fun. We just were able to up here, but also in the green room, just laugh and tell jokes and, and uh, just become, you know, deeper friends. So to thank you two and appreciate you two for the work you do and know that you're inspiring. Um, and I'm inspired by the work that's being done. Um, it motivates me because sometimes the burnout rate in, in cooking can be tough. Yeah. But when it's something you're passionate about and having people around that, um, can continue to motivate you and inspire you is something that's really special. So um, with that, I think we'll say thank you and also let everyone know that um, out in the Rasmussen Hall, I remembered um, Sean is doing a book signing. Um, um, so I highly recommend if you don't have it to go so get that book, get it signed, talk to Sean, talk to Freddie. Um, and also just one thing with that talking about, I just remembered I wanted to bring up was um, you know, talking about the research into foods and making sure it's correct. You know, nowadays you can go on the internet, you can search anything and you can find a recipe, but you don't know the heart of where that comes from. So supporting and buying, you know, true um, indigenous cookbooks from the source is incredibly important. So there's some amazing ones out there. If you're interested in cooking native cuisine um, or the ingredients, the recipes, the approaches, I highly recommend supporting these people um, in the work so that you know it's from the source, it's true to what it is, it's true to the heart of, of what it is. So. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.